I'm really excited to introduce to you guys today, Dr. Steph Weber. Uh, so Dr. Weber received a BA in chemistry, after which she earned her PhD in biochemistry at Stanford. She completed postdoctoral training at Princeton in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Dr. Weber was an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at McGill University, where she's been since 2016, but actually as of yesterday, she's a tenured associate professor. So, uh, um, she's been honored for her teaching, uh, but also as an emerging researcher. Um, and so we're so excited to have her here. Um, her work focuses on how spatial organization is achieved in dynamically remodeled in the cellular environment, and in particular, how membraneless organelles are formed and regulated. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Weber. Great. Well, thank you so much, McKenna, for the invitation and the, and the introduction. Um, this has been so fun, and just the diversity of of systems, but similar questions has just been fantastic. Um, so yeah, so um, today I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, scaling nuclear size and activity through development. So, um, so this is an electron micrograph of a mouse cell, typical eukaryotic cell. And, um, and what you see is a, a variety of compartments, different sizes, different shapes. Um, and, and what defines them is they're all, um, um, delimited by a membrane. And so the membrane creates a physical barrier between the inside of an organelle and the outside of the organelle. And that allows each compartment to maintain a distinct biochemical composition that's tailored to its function. Um, and so the, the um, nucleus maintains the genome, ER and Golgi, packaging sweat proteins, mitochondria make ATP, and all these specialized functions require, require this membrane. And so until about um, a decade ago, it was sort of assumed that the cytoplasm is, you know, freely mixed and everything is a homogeneous um, solution. And depending on what the function of these blue and red molecules are, that could have adverse effects on, on their function. Um, and so uh, Martin actually in the, in the previous talk right before lunch, like alluded to membraneless organelles in phase separation, but, um, but I'm going to give a, a bit more introduction. Um, so the, um, the or, uh, membrane bound organelles that I just showed you are uh, well preserved by ultrastructural techniques. And so they've been sort of considered in textbooks, the unit of intracellular organization. But cells also contain these membrane list organelles um, that are highly dynamic. So in, on the left um, are germ granules that assemble uh, uniformly throughout the um, early uh, C. elegans embryo. And then they sort of disappear at the anterior and they um, either stabilize or, or, or concentrate in the posterior. And this is important for the um, fate determination in, in the asymmetric developing embryo. Um, but these granules lack a membrane. Um, and so the molecules are, are free to sort of exchange and, and diffuse between these, um, these uh, droplets and, and the surrounding cytoplasm. Um, and then in, so, so they can respond to these developmental cues in the embryonic context, but they can also respond to environmental cues. Um, so here you have um, human cells growing in culture and they've thrown arsenite on the cells and they immediately, um, this protein starts out uh, homogeneous and then it um, uh, nucleates, here we go, into, um, into spherical um, droplet-like things that can fuse together and, and round up. Um, and it's reversible. So when the stress is removed, the, um, the proteins disperse back into the cytoplasm. I had my synchrony out of, out of sync with the videos today, sorry. Um, so <laughs> usually I have that done. Um, <laughs> rusty. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so the question when, when I started my po postdoc about 10 years ago, I feel old, um, was, was how do these molecules come together and stay together in a, in a coherent structure without, without a membrane, right? Why, don't, why doesn't entropy win and, and these molecules just, just diffuse around? And so what, uh, what Cliff noticed, my, my postdoctoral supervisor, was that a lot of these membraneless organelles um, behave like liquids. So here you have two um, nucleoli that have been dissected out of a xenopus oocyte, and they, fuse, they come together, they make contact, and then they fuse and they round up. Um, and then here you have these germ granules. So this, this central black circle is a nucleus and these germ granules wet against a nuclear envelope. And then if he applies 
force to the cover slip on, on your microscope, then, um, then they flow and drip and, and then fuse and round up in response to this applied shear. And so these look a lot like, you know, raindrops on, on your windshield. Um, and so um, they also, um, if, you, if you look at the components of many of these membraneless organelles, they're enriched for proteins that have multivalent domains. So folded, um, folded structures that are repeated many times that can interact uh, um, um, in specific stereospecific binding motifs, but because they're multivalent, they can interact combinatorially um, in, in many different ways. And if they're weak, then it, an unbinding event, you're not gonna you know, completely lose your partner because you're still bonded with, with another motif. Um, and if you purify these proteins, um, then in vitro, they can condense to form these beautiful spherical droplets. And similarly, many proteins in these membraneless organelles have um, intrinsically disordered regions. So these are um, lack a stable three-dimensional structure. They're just kind of floppy, um, uh, conformationally flexible um, proteins. And when they are purified and, um, and uh, together, then they can sometimes form hydrogels. Um, so these are like solid, um, like gummy bear-esque um, uh, materials. And so together, these, um, these two observations led us to hypothesize that membraneless organelles assemble through an intracellular phase transition. So we've got soluble molecules, and if the valency or the low complexity um, of the molecules is strong enough to hold them together and to overcome this entropic cost of, of ordering, um, then they can form these physiological granules, like the germ granules, the stress granules I showed you. And if the um, intermolecular interactions become too strong, then you can um, get fibers or, or solid like um, structures where the intermolecular interactions are irreversible. Um, and so, um, so we hypothesized that, you know, um, biological materials can span this spectrum of, of material properties. And indeed, um, people have shown in vitro that, um, that many proteins can be in a soluble form, in a condensed form, with either sort of liquid-like spherical um, shapes or amorphous fibrous um, things. Um, and so it's, it's been really well characterized now in, in vitro, but less has been done in vivo. Um, and so when I uh, started my postdoc, I was really interested in looking at these phase transitions in live cells. Um, and so to do this, we, uh, we used the nucleolus, which is one of the largest membraneless organelles. Um, and it's, it's conserved from, from yeast to human. So this, um, this protein here is fibrillarin, and the same protein um, in, in yeast localizes um, to, to the nucleus as, as in HeLa cells. And so the, the known molecular function of the nucleus is to synthesize um, ribosomal subunits. So it assembles around ribosomal DNA sites, and um, to, to synthesize them, it, it transcribes ribosomal RNA, and then it processes and packages these with ribosomal proteins that are synthesized in cytoplasm and brought back in. And then the large and small subunits of the ribosomes are exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where they translate proteins. Um, and so we chose to uh, use C. elegans as our model system. And since this is an embryology department, I <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have my dinos in here. Sorry, Phil. Um, but um, so I, I, I chose the embryo project, um, though I'll get a little out of embryogenesis um, later. Um, so yeah, so we, we started with the C. elegans embryo. Um, and so here, what you can see is the cell membrane is, is marked with a red uh, fluorescent protein, and the nucleolus, um, this fibrillarin, the same, same gene in yeast in humans, um, localizes to the nucleus. And in C. elegans, in diploid, they're, they're diploid. And so there are two rDNA sites per diploid genome. And so most of the time, you see two spots per cell, but sometimes they fuse to become one, one large one. OK, so, um, so the question when I started my postdoc was, how do these things assemble? We, we see that they are spherical. They um, behave sort of like droplets with, with this fusion behavior. Um, but what are, like, is this just an analogy or, or is it a real phase transition? Um, and so the first thing that, um, that we did was we can change um, the size of these embryos um, uh, genetically and, um, and then that changes the, the concentration of fibrillarin and other nuclear components in, in the nucleus. 
And so at a low concentration, we can, if we could, if we decrease the concentration low enough that we don't get nucleoli to assemble. And if we increase the concentration high enough, then we can induce nucleoli to assemble and we can make them bigger as we continue increasing the concentration. And so this um, led us to identify a, a concentration threshold below which the um, components remain dissolved and dispersed homogeneously in the nucleoplasm and above which they condense and um, increase in size proportional to the concentration. And so that's a, um, a hallmark prediction of, of a first order phase transition. In addition, if you keep the concentration constant, but change the size of the cell, um, then you should, um, you should see a, a proportional scaling. So a large, um, a large cell or nucleus will have more number of molecules um, than a small cell, even at the same concentration. And so you will get a larger structure when it, when it condenses. Um, and so that also checked out. Um, and then the, the most um, uh, interesting thing was if we watch this live, um, then you can see it's a super dynamic process. I've been showing you snapshots of, of two big, big spots. Um, and so you get um, dozens of small droplets initially, and then two droplets um, uh, grow more quickly than, than the others and, and become stable. Um, and so it turns out, and I... I'm not sure I have it here, but I think I have it later. Um, that these two spots correspond to the two rDNA loci. Um, and so if we look at the um, size of, of the small spots over time, then they increase with a relatively shallow slope that is consistent with both Brownian motion induced coalescence. So this is if you have um, droplets, they're moving around. If they encounter each other, they'll fuse, they'll get bigger. Um, and and we, we directly see that. So here there are initially three um, droplets that come, to, come together to form a single droplet. Um, and also diffusion limited Oswald ripening in which small droplets, um, material will leave small droplets because of its high curvature and, um, and diffuse through the medium and enter large droplets. And so you get overall an increase in the size of the droplets and a disappearance of, of small droplets. Um, and both of these um, mechanisms predict a scaling of one third of the radius of duration with, with time. And, and that is what we see for our small little droplets. And then the big droplets um, have a much faster scaling that we cannot predict <laughs> by um, um, classical physics. Um, and, and this is um, dependent on transcription of RNA polymerase one um, for, for ribosomal RNA. Uh, and so the coarsening kinetics also um, match these classical um, predictions from, from thermodynamics. So we concluded that nucleoli assemble through liquid-liquid phase separation, um, which was really cool. And, and I was very excited that we could predict the size um, uh, given the size of the nucleus, given the um, size and concentration of the, of the cell. But really, so what? <laughs> um, so the, the really interesting thing about these uh, membraneless organelles is what do they do? Um, and, and there's been a lot of um, a lot of effort on how they do it and what the molecular players are, but there's been relatively little on what the con fun functional consequences are. And, and it's hard to measure and we haven't either. Um, but I think that that is a, a big elephant in the room and, and where the field is slowly moving towards. Um, so there have been a, a variety of you know, hypotheses that have been proposed for, for what these things do. Um, and so one is a reaction crucible. So the idea is if you increase the local concentration of um, enzymes, then you can accelerate biochemical reactions. Um, and that, and the, um, the carbon fixation with Rubisco is a, is a classic example. Um, you can also do the opposite. So you could sequester an enzyme away from its substrate and inhibit reactions. Um, and then finally, especially in the nucleus, there's a lot of these membranous organelles in the nucleus, um, they can act as an organizational hub. And so there is, um, in, um, for the nucleus, especially the nucleus has been proposed to do all of these things, but um, it can bring together two rDNA loci from different chromosomes together and then perhaps co-regulate. And there is a lot of, um, uh, interesting work being done on enhancers right now and co-regulation of, of various various genes. Um, okay, so my question was, how do we measure nuclear activity? 
We have a system where we can change the size of the nucleus. Does that, and, and the assumption is that bigger nuclei can make more ribosomes, but is that actually true? Um, so ribosome biogenesis is a complex multi-step process, um, but the first step transcription um, of ribosomal RNA is thought to be rate limiting or certainly rate limiting in bacteria and yeast, and perhaps that, um, that holds true in, in worms. So, so what we did was we um, used fluorescence and C2 hybridization. Um, so the ribosomal RNA genes are encoded in tandem repeats. So there are um, three genes, 18S, 5.8S, and 26S. And then there are like intron-like sequences. Um, so it's transcribed all in a single, um, single transcript. And then these are, are cut out. So if you try to fish against the ribosomal um, RNA, the entire cell would light up because there's so many ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Um, and so we designed fish probes against just these internally transcribed spacers, which should only be present in newly transcribed genes because they'll get spliced out as the um, our RNA is processed. Okay, so, um, so here what we did was we did fish on just a mixed population of, um, of C. elegans embryos. And on the x-axis, we have the Nuclear intensity, basically this is the size of the nucleus um, based off of the fluorescence intensity of this fibrillarin gene that we had before. And then on the y-axis, we have the signal of, of fish, which are, and our probes are in red. And so what you can see immediately is there's a very um, strong positive correlation um, where larger nuclei um, are able to produce larger um, amounts of um, transcription. Um, and so, you know, maybe that uh, it's at least consistent with the hypothesis that um, the size of the nucleus, or at least the presence of the nucleus, um, can, can activate um, or accelerate transcription. So that would be the reaction crucible. Um, but it is equally plausible that transcription of ribosomal RNA um, produces binding sites for proteins that will bind to, to this RNA. Um, and so here we have sort of a chicken and egg thing that we can't really tease apart. We also have a mixed population of embryos that are undergoing differentiation. And so in this comma stage, which is a relatively late stage embryo, um, you can see that there are some cells that have really large nuclei and a lot of transcription, and some cells that have really small, almost undetectable nucleoli and, and very little transcription. And so there are clear um, lineage specific differences in um, in both nucleolar assembly and, and transcription. And so to try to compare apples to apples, we went back to our early embryo where we um, can compare the same cell across multiple different lineage, or not lineages, multiple different um, RNAi conditions where we can change the concentration of, of nucleolar components. Um, and so in, in this case, the um, the, we, we have small, large nuclei with small nucleoli um, don't transcribe very much. And when we increase the concentration of, of nuclear components, we get large nuclei and we get um, a lot more uh, transcription out. And so here we have a direct um, you know, apples to apples comparison. If we increase the size of the nucleus, then we can get more, more transcription. Um, and, and I mentioned um, before that we can also um, sort of compare these, these two different types of, of um, droplets that we see. So the, the one, um, you get both these small, what we call the ends for extra nucleolar droplets um, um, that coexist with, with these larger droplets. Um, and, but if we inhibit transcription, so now we get dozens of droplets, but they all are roughly the same size and they have the same kinetics as these small um, droplets in, in the wild type case. And, um, and over here we have the, the fish. So you can see that the two large um, uh, nucleoli co-localize with the nascent transcripts. And so these are the true nucleoli and these other smaller droplets are, the, um, are these 
extra nucleolar um, things that, that are smaller. And so this suggests that there actually is a feedback between having um, active sites of transcription stabilizes the, the droplets and allows them to, um, to get larger and to grow more, more quickly. Um, okay, and then we went, uh, we looked earlier in development. So I should have mentioned this, but that was at the eight cell stage. Um, and so nucleoli first assemble um, in the eight cell stage. Um, in, in most of the lineages at least. And, and we see um, uh, nascent transcription occurring in, at the A cell stage when, when these nuclei are present. But we also, somewhat surprisingly, at least to me, was that we saw transcription occurring even at the two cell stage and the four cell stage when we don't see condensation of protein. So you can get transcription even in the absence of having at least a macroscopic detectable by our microscope yes there might be something below the diffraction limit um, um, without without this large um, thing um, and I should mention this surprised me but then you know you read the old literature and 25 years ago Geraldine said you had already done that um, okay so so it, it, we're still working this out, but there, there's definitely a bi-directional feedback loop between nucleolar size and um, our DNA transcription. And it appears to depend both on um, developmental time and on lineage. Um, and so this is just a schematic of the C. elegans um, embryogenesis. And so early in development, there seems to be an uncoupling between nucleolar size and um, transcriptional activity. Um, it is directly proportional before they undergo um, gastrulation and, and differentiation. And then in later um, stages of embryogenesis, it's absolutely dominated by lineage specific um, effects. So here, these giant <laughs> nuclei you see here are in the developing intestine. So, so yeah, so that is sort of the um, first um, scan that we've done throughout embryogenesis. And we're now trying to um, more quantitatively um, uh, get the relationship between nuclear size and transcriptional activity as a function of these of these different um, sort of developmental stages. Um, and so we I started with with the embryo because it doesn't move and it's easy to image. Um, turns out once they hatch, they're crawling all over the place. Um, so, but the the truth is is that um, nuclei are not required for embryogenesis, the worms hatch even if they um, don't have RDNA. There's so much maternally loaded ribosomes that what they are producing is, is a drop in the bucket. Um, and so in terms, of, um, in terms of molecular function, it's actually a pretty good system, but in terms of organismal function, it's not necessarily the most re relevant system. So what we've been um, doing a lot in my lab is trying to develop the, the tools to look in post-embryonic development. Um, and so if we think about the C. elegans life cycle, um, it, and at different times, it has a different demand for ribosomes. Um, and so if, we've, if we think about this, in, in the embryo, um, it's got in a lot of uh, ribosomes from mom, and so it doesn't really need to make its own. But um, once it hatches during larval development, it has to crank this up because it's going to grow exponentially, and it's got um, to make ribosomes. Um, and then in, in adults, they're no longer growing. They're just maintaining, you know, homeostasis. And so they might need to, you know, uh, replenish and, and turn over, uh, but they're, they're no longer growing exponentially. And then um, when worms are starved or overcrowded, they enter what's called um, a dour state, which is kind of like a dormant spore-like um, uh, state that is very long lived. And during that time, they basically turn off metabolism. Um, and so, um, they likely don't um, uh, make rib ribosomes um, during that time, um, but when they transition back and, and the environment changes, then they need to rapidly ramp up, ramp back up. Um, and so what we are trying to do now is look at each of these um, different stages in the life cycle and study the stu structure function um, relationship of, of the nucleus. Um, so the, the first one that we looked at, or actually um, uh, Shravanti Upaluri, another postdoc in Cliff's lab, looked at before we, we left, was um, during larval development. So, so as I mentioned, when, when the worms hatch, um, they're, they're tiny and cute, but then they, they grow um, exponentially very, very quickly. 
Um, and so to keep up with, with this growth, um, the, the size of the nucleus actually scales linearly with the size of the cell um, from an L1 larva, so the first larval stage, to the L4 larva. Um, and interestingly, actually, we were surprised that the nucleus itself does not scale, scale sublinearly. And um, what we think is going on here is in order to, for the nucleus to scale linearly with cell size, um, you would have the cell, the, each cell would have to synthesize an exponentially more amount of nuclear components to maintain this um, equilibrium between, um, between the condensed state and the um, um, dissolved uh, pool in the, in the nucleoplasm. But by having the nucleus um, smaller relative to the nucleus, so the volume fraction of the nucleus um, increases um, with, with time, then the cell can be more efficient with its nuclear components and still make enough ribosomes to, to keep up. Okay, so, so thus far, I've been just talking about size of, of spherical um, liquid-like droplets. Um, and so this is based on the very simple assumption of, of a two-component system where you have um, nucleoplasm and you have nucleolar components, in this case, green. Um, and so if you increase the concentration of nucleolar components, um, initially, nothing will happen. Everything will remain dissolved. And then once you... Um, cross the phase boundary and, and hit this saturation concentration, then you will nucleate droplets. And if you, if the concent actual concentration, cellular concentration is, is greater um, than the saturation concentration, then you will get um, droplets of, of increasing size. But um, the cell is not an equilibrium system and it is not a two component system. And so um, it's not, becoming increasingly clear that many of these membraneless organelles um, adopt metastable or, or solid phases. Um, and so you can have this liquid-liquid phase separation as you cross this barrier or this uh, boundary, but then you can, um, these condensed phases can mature into gels or glasses or fibers, um, like one of the examples I showed you earlier. And even in these spherical droplets, um, these Organelles can exhibit a, a spectrum of material properties from, from viscous liquids all the way to elastic solids. And finally, they're not single components. Um, so many of these have you know, dozens to hundreds of components um, and they can actually phase separate even within the, um, within the condensate. And so you can get multi-phase um, structures with, with different um, compositions and different emissible phases within each um, uh, organelle. And so the nucleus is, um, is a three component, or not three component, three compartment, hundreds of component um, system um, that forms um, three sub compartments. So there is a uh, fibrillar center that forms around the ribosomal DNA. There's a dense fibrillar component that um, is this sort of intermediate donut uh, where RNA processing happens. And then there is a granular component that forms a large um, uh, outer shell. Um, and each of these compartments exhibit distinct material properties. So this is um, FRAC against um, uh, the, the um, sorry, I should label this better, against one of the inner, inner subcompartments and, and the outer subcompartment. And what you can see is that there's faster and more complete recovery in the outer compartment, indicating that it is more liquid-like and, um, and slower and incomplete recovery in the, in the inner compartment, indicating that it is more viscoelastic. Um, and so for us to be able to look at any of this um, multi-phase organization, we needed to be able to look at the different compartments. And so, so far, all I've shown you are images labeled with fibrillarin, this one highly conserved nuclear component. Um, and so um, our lab's big triumph of the pandemic was getting a tricolor CRISPR worm line. Um, and so, uh, so my graduate student, um, Peng, um, labeled three different markers with three different colors, cross the worms together. And so now we can look at all three compartments at each developmental stage. 
Um, and so what, what he found was that the size and shape of the nucleus changed during post-embryonic development. So in L1s, you get a small spherical um, uh, GC compartment with a single FC DFC unit. But as the worms um, develop through, through larval development, they get more number of, um, of FC DFC components. And, um, and the, the GC, the, the large outer compartment, increases in size and, and also in aspect ratio, so it becomes less spherical. And so all three of these compartments increase in total volume, but the, um, the FC and the DFC are, are fragmented. So it's not growing isotropically. Um, and because transcription occurs at the um, interface between the FC and the DFC, we think this is important for um, scaling transcription with the, um, with the size of, of the nucleus to, to um, keep up with the, with the growing demand for, for larval development. And we have a, we have a new postdoc, uh, Leah Baldini, who is looking um, during aging. And so what she found something really interesting. Um, so in, um, in early adults, she sees the, um, the, the same morphology that Peng saw in, in larvae, where you get a single, um, a single GC with multiple um, uh, inner compartments. But over as the worms age, the nucleus seems to invert, where you get um, caps of, of DFC proteins on the periphery. Um, and, the, and the GC rounds up. And this is very reminiscent of a phenomenon called nucleolar segregation that occurs um, in mammalian cells in response to either DNA damage or RNA transcription inhibition. Um, and so here you can see MPM1 is, the, uh, is a GC marker. Um, the green marker is a marker of the DFC. And when... Um, when they induce transcription, or sorry, when they induce DNA damage, um, the, the internal um, DFCs move to the periphery. And so it looks like the same thing is happening um, during aging, perhaps a consequence of um, less efficient transcription during, um, during the aging process. And we see a similar thing um, uh, happening in Dower. Um, so this is this is very preliminary, and we haven't quantified anything yet here. But um, so we've looked at um, some DAC2 mutants. There's a temperature sensitive uh, mutant that can, um, at 20 degrees, go through normal uh, larval development. And here we see a, 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 in L3, um, we see a spherical nucleus with a single central um, fibrillar sensor. And in um, in Dower, when we when we heat shock the worms. Um, the, the FC sort of inverts and you see um, this characteristic uh, sort of shell uh, or half shell um, split between the, between the FC cores. Um, and, the, and the GC is much less um, uh, spherically shaped. And so this is just a flavor of what we're starting to put together um, to map um, the structure function landscape of, of the nucleus throughout the cell cycle or life cycle of the um, of C. elegans. And so this is this is um, speculative made up uh, surface. Um, so but we can um, we can now measure the size and um, and the material properties and the activity of each subcompartment um, at each developmental stage. And so what we can start to do is map out not only what the functional not only how the structure of the nucleus changes in response to different developmental um, uh, demands, um, but also the, um, the, the function of, of that or not. Um, okay, and so um, as, a, as a final, um, just short story, um, we've also been going back to, to the embryo to look at a, um, to try to identify molecules that we, or genes that we can use to manipulate um, the nuclear assembly and size. And so uh, an undergraduate, James Goldberg, um, did a, an RNA, targeted RNAi uh, screen where he just dissected embryos and, and looked at their nuclear assembly. And so I, I mentioned earlier at the four cell stage um, in, in wild type animals, um, nuclei don't assemble, but they do at the eight cell stage. And I don't know what is different here, um, but it's a useful developmental switch because we can look for genes that either induce nucleoli to assemble 
um, at the four cell stage or prevent nuclei from assembling at the at the eight cell stage. And so here is just a, a couple of our um, of our hits that we're following up on. Um, so the so NCL1 and um, C36E8.1 are were known genes. Um, uh, and so, so these were our positive controls. Um, but we also found um, kin 3 which encodes the uh, catalytic subunit of casein kinase 2, which is known to phosphorylate a, a number of um, regulators of transcription of um, uh, RNA polymerase 1. Um, and, um, and it is differentially expressed throughout development. So it's highly um, active in, in the embryo um, and, and less so later in development. And in the adult, it, it comes back up, but that's because the adults are gravid and have, have embryos. And one of the um, targets of, uh, of kin 3 is DAO5. So DAO5 um, encodes um, a, pr a protein called Dower and aging overexpressed. So it's overexpressed in, um, in Dower larvae and in um, old worms. Um, and it's a homolog of NAP140, which is one of the most um, phosphorylated proteins in the human genome. And it's a, and it's a target of CK2. Um, and it has a really interesting architecture uh, protein architecture that looks a lot like these intrinsically disordered regions um, where it has alternating blocks of negative and positive charge and is almost is predicted to be almost completely disordered. And so um, with that, I just gave you a sort of an overview of what we're trying to do um, to characterize how C. elegans um, tunes the phase behavior of the nucleus. Um, so it's very clear that the size, shape, and composition of the nucleus changes throughout development. And what we want to understand is how these changes relate to ribosome biogenesis activity, um, and then ultimately how they impact animal physiology. Um, and so right now we've been focusing a lot at sort of like the subcellular level and this um, phase behavior, um, but we are gearing up to, to look at transcription and ultimately growth. So a lot of these mutants um, that affect nuclear morphology have larger body size and faster growth rates. Um, and so eventually we'd, we'd like to um, look, at, look at larger length scales. And so with that, I'm gonna thank my lab. So um, Peng and Leia did the majority of the work I, I talked about today. James started the RNAi screen, um, CHR for funding and you guys for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>